Hello, I'm Ronald Day, Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy, and welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the criminal justice system from various perspectives, including from those most impacted by the criminal justice system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that is affected by it. We ask you, the viewer, to spread the word about Both Sides of the Bars and share your comments with us on Twitter at The Fortune Society. So today we're going to be talking about policy and practice with respect to parole. And I want to thank our guests, Bob Dennison and Kenneth Ennis, for being here with us today. Bob Welcome. Dennison has spent a long career in corrections and in parole, mm -hmm. all right? Most recently as the chair of the parole board, a former parole board commissioner, parole officer, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Kenneth Ennis is yes. an alternative to incarceration counselor at the Fortune Society. Yes. Thank you for being here, uh, Kenny. Welcome. So you've uh, spent some time inside. You've been involved in myriad programs while you were there, including college. I understand yes. that you're close to earning your bachelor's degree. So we look forward to, to hearing you, you know, talk about some of these issues. Okay. All right, so we want to talk about parole policy and practice in New York State, mm -hmm. right? And we know that there's been a lot of controversy around some of the parole board decisions that have been made. Um, there's, with respect to people who have been convicted of violent felony offenses, it's really hard for them to, to get out on parole. And so for our audience, I think it would be good for you, Bob, considering your extensive experience, to just give our viewers some context about parole board practice. Okay, um, the parole board is made up now of 13 commissioners and a chairperson, and they go around to the prisons in New York State, although actually for the most part now they're teleconferenced. You know, they used to go around to the individual prisons, but now the vast majority are teleconferenced to an office, which in my opinion is a bad practice because when you are making a decision on a person's life and whether or not they're suitable to come back into the community, it's much more important to have a face-to-face -face interview with the person, not on a a television screen. Yes, I've heard that that's very impersonal. Very impersonal. And people don't get a chance to interact with the parole commissioners the way that they would like. It, it's also a disadvantage to the person coming before the parole board because it's much easier to deny somebody if it's you're in an impersonal situation. Okay. It's easier to deny somebody. Yeah. And is it true that people don't even get a chance to focus on the parole commissioners if they are three? They oftentimes, according to what I heard, is that they focus on one person who is the one who's usually asking the question. That's true. Okay, at, almost at the end, then they focus on the three of them. But basically, you're right. They focus on the one person. They don't even see the other people, really. Yes. They see the one yeah. person. Okay. So basically, you know, the, in my opinion, since I retired, I've been, you know, working with people serving life sentences to try to I go back to the prisons to try to prepare them for the parole board, write letters for them. You know, I'm not saying I make any a difference. I don't know. Maybe some, maybe no. But um, also, the people serving life sentences to me are the, are the you know, the, 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 there's many pe people serving life sentences in New York State prison, and they don't have any conditional release date. So unless yes. the parole board lets them out, yes. they, they stay in prison. And conditional release for our audience is a time when the parole board is like required to release them if they haven't yes. been in trouble or yes. received additional charges. Or yes, anything, yes, right? yes. And but but these guys don't have con CR dates. Right. In 1998, the law was changed so that you know if you got convicted of a violent crime, except for murder, yes. uh, you got a determinate sentence. So you never see the parole. Board. Those guys who got convicted from 98 on don't see the parole board. Right. So now it's 2008, 2008, almost. Almost, well, it's 18 years. Wow. So there's not, you know, there's not too many with the old indeterminate sentences left, but there are some. Anyway, the parole board, the problem that society has created is they set up this other group of people to look at the same set of facts that the trier of fact, the judge, looked at when he made his decision to give a guy 25 to life or less, 15, because that's the lowest you can get on a murder case, 15 to life. And society has set up this other group of people to look at the facts again. The, okay. the problem with that is um, it was fresh in the minds of the judge. Mm -hmm. It's not fresh in the minds of the parole board. Okay. And 
the difference between letting sending somebody to prison and letting somebody out is is great. If a judge, if if, if the parole board is concerned about not letting people out because of what they did, or not letting people out because of how it will affect how society will look at it, mm -hmm. and the fact that they put their name on the green sheet, the release mm -hmm. sheet. Um, it's very different from the sentencing judge. If somebody, if society, or say there's some infamous killing, or if the society feels that the person should get 25 to life, and the judge gives them less than 25 to life, let's say gives them 20 or 18, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it's, it's not really a big deal. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, because the guy's still going away for a long time, but on the other hand, society has set up this other group of people to look at it again and let them out, or not let mm -hmm. them out. So. Yeah. It's a big difference between when you're the releasing mechanism, mm -hmm. no matter how much time a guy did. I mean, there are some mm -hmm. guys who got 15 to life sentences who are serving, been in 30 years. There's a guy at, that, I won't mention his name, he's got a sentence as a juvenile, nine to life. He's been held 33 years. Wow. Wow. Uh, it's, you know, so the problem is these indeterminate sentences for, for murder. Okay, so let me move on to thank you for giving that no. important uh, background information for our audience who are not necessarily informed about right. just general parole board practice. Uh, so, Kenny, let's turn to you now because you have some personal experience that we think is very valuable that you can share having served some time and having gone before a parole board. So why don't you tell us, uh, uh, tell, tell the audience about that experience. Okay, sure. Yeah, um... I ended up serving um, a total of 27 years, and um, I was uh, arrested, tried, and convicted for, uh, for a homicide that I didn't commit. Mm. So I always felt that I suffered double indemnity. Mm. You know, I had to do 25 years of life, on top of that, for something I didn't even do. Sure. So um, I had to like contend with that throughout my incarceration. And it always bothered me, how am I going to present, if I don't win appeal, how am I going to present that to the parole board and have them uh, judge me fairly? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was a big, um, big um, fight for me. Sure. So uh, during the beginning of my time, after I was uh, sent upstate, uh, I would just, I would say fortunate enough to, to meet a group of guys that had already formulated like a, a ideology of how to do time. Mm -hmm. Because nobody, no one teaches, there's nothing that you could read that says, okay, this is how you do 25 years and mm -hmm. then go to the parole board and appear in front, front of the parole board and be granted release. Nobody, sure. it, that's not written. Sure. So um, I met a, a dynamic group of guys who started study groups mm -hmm. and um, that became the, um, the backbone mm -hmm. of they 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 didn't use the word uh, rehabilitation. They used the word empowerment. How mm -hmm. will we empower ourselves yeah. to, be, to to become better than when we came in? So the decision that you made as a person who was not guilty, going before a parole board, that had to be tough because it's like, well, I'm going to this parole board. Generally, in order to get granted parole, they want you to kind of like can see that you've committed a crime, right, and that you are you know, remorseful mm -hmm. and so forth. So how did you go about addressing that particular issue? Okay. Well, I guess I finally got it right after the third try okay. because I went to the pro board three times. The first time, I thought I had it right. Mm -hmm. You know, I was granted, um, after 25 years, I was granted um, the limited time credit allowance, yes. meaning that... You know, I, I served my time well. Yes. I uh, met some criteria, so I was able to earn six months off my sentence. Yes. So I go in front of the panel, and I thought I had a good hearing. Mm -hmm. but, and I told them that, you know, you know I didn't commit the crime. Mm -hmm. and, they, and I thought it was a good hearing because it's very respectful mm -hmm. and whatnot. But they said, okay, you'll be hearing from us. Mm -hmm. So then uh, two days later, I got, a, I got a, um, a letter from the parole board saying I was denied. Mm -hmm. So I, now I have, to, I have to reprocess that. What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. But what I had to my favor is that because I went to the pro board six months early, you know, it was like a little practice. Mm -hmm. So now I'll be going to my initial pro board six months um, uh, later, later on. Okay. So I try to message what I could out of uh, 
that one experience and, and, and parlay that to my second experience and try to see how could I make my, my presentation to this panel and um, so they could see that I wasn't a threat to society. Mm -hmm. And um, and I so I, I uh, when I was denied the first time, they said uh, I showed a lack of remorse. Mm -hmm. So the second time, I try to be remorseful. Mm -hmm. I try to be compassionate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and again, we went through the whole uh, process. And I was asked, uh, well, you say you didn't do it. What happened? Um, you're saying you, um, you were set up? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, well, um, you could say that if you like. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I didn't commit the crime. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't want to you know, come off as being arrogant sure. or smart aleck or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I just try to be as humble as I could be. Sure. And, and, and so the, I was told by the commissioner, said, look, you, you're making it really tough for us because you did a lot of good things. You got a lot of people supporting you mm -hmm. and stuff. But on the other hand, you say you didn't commit the crime. Okay. So, so that was like the balance and act, I guess, the, that panel had. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what happened is that they denied me parole at that time. Okay. So one of the things that Kenny just said is, what did I do wrong? And we know a lot of people that are going to the parole board are saying that they feel like they've done everything right. Like they've uh, been involved in all of the programs that the Department of Corrections Community Supervision has to offer. They feel like they've uh, you know, changed their lives in as much as many of them possibly can under the circumstances. And they come with uh, a lot of letters and certificates about you know mm -hmm. stuff that they've done inside uh, letters of reasonable assurances from organizations about the services that they can offer in the community, but they're still hit. And as you said, many times repeatedly. And one of the things that happened recently is that uh, like some of the court decisions have said they need to use a risk assessment, assessment instrument called COMPASS. Mm -hmm. And that risk assessment instrument, what it does is it says, well, what are the scores, right, so that we can make a determination about whether or not this person poses a threat, right, mm -hmm. or risk to public safety. A lot of these individuals, it seems like the vast majority of them, have low uh, risk scores on the compass. So can you enlighten our audience about how someone can, the parole commissioners can use a risk assessment, have a low score, and still deny a person parole? Yeah, because um, many times they don't care about the compass risk assessment tool. Wow. Most guys serving life sentences have very low scores. The commissioners know that they're not a risk to society. But the way the executive law reads, which has never been changed in spite of these changes that people thought were going to make a difference, which didn't, is that release on parole is not a reward for good behavior. Okay. So the commissioners can assign whatever weight they want to whatever they want to. Okay. So, and a lot of guys feel like maybe they did something wrong in the interview. Mm -hmm. Usually that's not the case. Usually they did everything right. It's just the commissioners don't like what you did. So it's about the crime. It's about the crime. They can't come out and say it like that. I mean, they, they do in the denial, but they can't, sure. you know, they don't say it to you when you're, mm -hmm. you know, when you're sort of advocating for yourself to get paroled. Yes. Um, so basically, since society or since the uh, legislature lets lets them decide to give weight to whatever they want. All these other things, I can have volumes of support letters, volumes of programs, no tickets. It may count 1%. I mean, they don't break it down percentage-wise, but it basically, many times, it's not important. So that's why guys get hit for the crime. Got it. And so, Kenny, you were there. Uh, you went to the parole board three times. You know other people who went to the parole board five and ten times. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk about the frustration that people feel at a situation where they think that they have a chance, mm -hmm. you know, going to the parole board, as Bob is saying, and making a compelling case mm -hmm. for why they could be released and not a threat to public safety, and then they're denied mm -hmm. anyway? Yeah, it's very frustrating. You know, um, I know plenty of guys um, still haven't gotten, you know, filled in their mind. They haven't gotten right, but like what um, Mr. Dennis has said, sometimes you, 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 you didn't do anything wrong. Sure. But we just we just don't know, so um, it's very frustrating because you say, look, you know, I'm not a threat to society, yes. you know, and you feel that you're not you never gonna get that chance. Mm -hmm. After one appearance and two appearance, and you get denied, you, you say, I'm not gonna get that chance to mm -hmm. um, to show that I'm not a threat to society, to reclaim my um, my my citizenship, mm -hmm. just to reclaim my liberty. You feel I'm not gonna get that chance. It's very frustrating. You start to feel less than. 
Yeah. You know, it must like, be depressing, too. Very, very, very depression. Yeah. I think that we all go through a bout yeah. of depression. Yeah. I know I did. Yeah, everybody. Like, uh, the first time I got denied, the second time. And um, me, I, I actually had to um, call on my um, theology training. Because I, I, I took this program, um, Rising Hope, the Certificate of Ministry and Human Services. Mm -hmm. So after I got the, I had my certificate before I went to the pro board the, the second time. But now here I am, I'm up a third time. So, so this whole mm -hmm. thing about humanity, I have, to, I have to appeal to the humanity in this human being, mm -hmm. or these human beings that's going to be in this panel in front of me. Mm -hmm. So I had to say, well, okay, now how am I going to now present a presentation where they engage me in a conversation for considering me for release, yeah. knowing that I said I was innocent from the beginning. Sure. So I said, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. And it's with, with a lot of training because we, we, we uh, conduct mock uh, parole interviews inside in all the study groups. We're always mm -hmm. preparing and preparing mm -hmm. and preparing. So what I said, I said, I had to tell the panel in my open, I said, look, um, I maintain my innocence f from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, my direct appeal is exhausted, and I had no other alternative but to rehabilitate myself. Mm -hmm. And I know that this panel is going to judge me for release based on that decision and what I've done to rehabilitate myself. Mm -hmm. And from that, there, at the third time, maybe it became a non-issue, and they were able to move past my innocence, mm -hmm. my, my claim of innocence, and engage me in other conversation, other dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, I thought. Okay. And, Bob, so you are... <laughs> probably very much on the opposite spectrum now <laughs> of where you were when you were making decisions, right? Because the pro board commissioners who are there now would probably disagree maybe even vehemently with your position that, that um, you know, that the decisions are, you know, based on X and that they're, they're not giving a fair chance to people who are adequately prepared. What is it that people can do in order to to be able to increase the chances that they'll get released? I mean, it's really hard to give positive suggestions. I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean, sometimes there's nothing they can do. I mean, they, mm. they, they know how to, guys who are serving, who are serving long sentences are usually are very articulate. Mm -hmm. They know what to tell the parole board. They're speaking sure. honestly to the parole board. Yes. And it oftentimes doesn't make a difference. For example, there are guys who get sometimes released uh, like after the sixth or seventh parole board. Mm -hmm. So that's 12 or 14 or 16 years if you go eight times. So yeah. it's the same guy that the parole board saw 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. Nothing's changed yeah. except yeah. the fact that he's been in prison longer. Exactly. And unfortunately, in my opinion, many times that's what the parole board is looking for. A yeah. guy to stay in prison longer. Yeah. It doesn't matter yeah. that he was rehabilitated. It doesn't matter that he's not a threat to society. It's just, as I said before, because society's given this other group of people the power, yeah. and they can say, you know what, the judge may have said this, mm -hmm. but I feel he should stay in prison longer, and it doesn't really matter what he says. They're not going to say that. It doesn't really matter. It's the law lets me do, the law gives me the right to hold a guy based on what he did for whatever time I want to hold him. Yeah. So I don't think there's anything a guy can do except, I don't know, just try to be as positive as he can. Mm -hmm. But it's very, it's, a, it's a sort of a dire situation for a lot of people. Got it. And so, Kenny, again, having gone to the parole board, like, what suggestions do you have for the family members of people who are inside? And you, know, you had to be mm -hmm. in contact with your family, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that tell them Mm -hmm. who were probably hopeful when you went that, you know, there's letdowns. Right. You know, what suggestions do you have for, for family members and for individuals, for them to communicate to their loved ones inside? Okay, okay well, one thing that you have to do is be honest from the beginning, because yeah. a lot of times we have hope yeah. that, that uh, we're going to win appeal. So I think that conversation starts way at the beginning mm -hmm. of the sentence, that you say, look, we have an appeal pro um, um, process, but, you know, but it's a possibility that, you know, I could be denied. Yes. And then when you fast forward to your parole time, you know, you try to get letters of support. You, you try to get, like, um, people in the community to support you, to help mm -hmm. advocate for you. I was able to do a lot of that. And yeah. I think that was helpful also because I had mm -hmm. the commissioner it, um, to hold up a, a, 
a, a, a manila <laughs> envelope of um, of letters. He said, you got He said, you're making the decision hard. You got you got over 100 letters from the community, most of them in pe petition form, mm -hmm. and that just boosts my confidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to have a strategy. Mm -hmm. You have to have you have to have a strategy where other people um, buy in to on uh, wanting to release you. Mm -hmm. You know, so and that start like, after I got hit the second time, I got denied that second trip. Mm -hmm. I spent two years, my whole two. Years, I studied the pro board and I studied it intensively that last two years. Like, what could I do? Um, how could I do this? How could I get another letter? And I just wrote to everybody, wrote to mm -hmm. everybody, and had my sisters and family member, my brothers, and everybody knew write something, sure. you know. And I and I even came up with a template letter, because mm -hmm. people get stuck. They say, okay, well I don't know what to write, I don't know what to say. Where's the template? Just fill it in, yeah. and send it in yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and send it in from different uh, locations. If you have family in different states or whatnot, mm -hmm. that's what I did. Because sure. that now that kind of speak to the fact that that. Some people do care about you. Mm -hmm. So again, um, when I'm doing a mock parole um, preparation, mm -hmm. I'm always saying that you, you, you're right. It's, it's, it's like, it's up to the commissioner. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying you're making a compassionate plea for mercy. Yes. Now can we do that? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the goal. So hopefully that you connect with somebody's uh, humanity yeah. They said, look, this, this, person is some, this person has some unfinished business. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me let him go. Yeah. You know, I, I, could, I don't have to worry about uh, the 6 o'clock news saying he yeah. did something crazy. And then it says, I'm the person that gave him that second chance, that they could actually bank on your release. Yeah. Thank you for that. Just let me just add one thing. You yeah, know, I, I know you know this, but it's really hard on the people's families because the people's families, guys in prison, their families think that they must not be telling us the truth mm -hmm. because he should have got out. I mean, if mm -hmm. he's saying all these things that he said he, he, he sent and, and, and did, he, there was no reason why he didn't get out. Mm -hmm. right. So a lot of times it's hard for yeah. guys going to the board, their families, because they think, that, you know, maybe they're lying, maybe they're, yeah. you know, there's something else they're missing. Exactly. So mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's yeah, another exactly. hard. That's another hard. Hard, hard big yes. hurdle. Yeah. And you talk about, you know, it's dire for some people. One thing that we want to do is raise awareness in the community of what they can do because you know sometimes there are hearings in Albany and some of the members of the state legislature are trying to have uh, parole board commissioners be you know held accountable for certain decisions and because one thing they, that you mentioned that they have a tendency of focusing on is the nature of the crime mm -hmm. that's the one thing that never changes and so what do you suggest that can be changed, or at least to, to continue to raise awareness in the community? Well, I think one of the things is to, to show or to, to, to demonstrate that people serving long sentences generally don't come back to prison. In yeah. other words, they don't recidivate. They, yeah. they are a very good risk to be let out. Yeah. Another point is if the judge in sentencing this individual gave them less than the maximum, mm -hmm. then basically the judge is telling the parole board, look, this is what I felt the guy should do mm -hmm. as a result of what he did. Mm -hmm. You know, the parole board should be accountable as to why they hold guys who have been sentenced less than the maximum uh, time and time again yeah. when the judge has already said to them, he didn't say it like I'm saying it, but he mm -hmm. said to them by giving them the sentence, look, I'm okay with 18 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. I mean, uh, you know, those those pro boards should explain. Well, they shouldn't really be able to hold those people as long as the person has done well in prison. As sure. most guys serving right. life sentences do wonderful in mm -hmm. prison. So, yeah. you know, that's the issue. You know, those those two factors. And I know this is not going to affect guys in prison, but I really feel that there should be determinate sentences for 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 murder too. And not indeterminate sentences. So that would take the parole board. Yeah, out that would of take the, the parole equation. board out of the picture. The guy would know how many years he's getting. Mm -hmm. It'll be fairer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you give, if, how many guys serving 25 to life now would jump at the opportunity for a straight 40 with a CR date? Because mm -hmm. the CR date would be like in 26. Mm -hmm. I, I, I ventured about all of them would jump at mm -hmm. that opportunity because sure. it's a definite date when you're getting home. Sure. Right now, guys have no idea when, they, when, they get, right. when they're sentenced. That when they even when they take a plea, mm -hmm. they're sort of led to believe, oh, you know what? If I do well in prison, I'm going to be out mm -hmm. after 15. If I get 15 to yeah. life, but it doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't always work. work that way. Okay. It rarely works that way. Right. You know, so that's 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 those are the issues. You know, okay. but uh, 
Right. And Kenny, we have you know, t no, two minutes or so left. What recommendations would you have for uh, changes to the parole board? Well, um, one, one, recommendation, one recommendation I would have is uh, like some type of community-specific oversight board, somebody yeah. that could like uh, check the um, parole board's a report card, yeah. you know, their, their, their statistics and see what's happening and ask the question why uh, guys that are convicted from murder, if they're the best ones, if they do the best in prison, they do well mm -hmm. in prison, and why are there such a low percentage of them being released? Mm -hmm. And with some type of legislative authority. Yeah. Other than that, then I don't think that nothing would happen. Well, well, just one other point yeah. I mentioned, or I didn't mention. Um, also, the legislature should change the law, mm -hmm. whereby the judge has a right to give a guy his freedom as opposed to sending him back for a de novo hearing. If the right. judge, if a guy files an appeal and there's merit to his appeal mm -hmm. and the judge considers it, instead of sending it back to the parole board again, because I'm sure you guys have seen yeah. guys have de novo hearings and they right. get held again. I mean, right. it's, it's more yes. common to get held. Let the judge release the person. He okay. feels there was some merit there. Let him release the person <laughs> rather than okay. bounce it back to them. Right. So. Well, that's both, that's both of those suggestions are, are very, very helpful. Thank you. Kenny for being on the show. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Bob, Welcome. for being here as well. Welcome. My and pleasure. so thank you, uh, Bob Dennison and Kenneth Ennis, for joining us on both sides of the bars. And thank you in TV land as well. If you're interested in finding out more about Fortune Society, please check us out on the web at fortunesociety.org or on Facebook by typing in the Fortune Society. This is Ronald Day as we critically look at both sides of the bars. <laughs>